A little while ago, I did a video on the standard lib module Funk Tools. It's a really useful module to have. There's a lot of really cool things in it. If you want to see that video, I've done, uh, or, there, or there'll be a card in the top corner. Today, I want to focus in more on the caching elements because I did a little bit on the caching in that video, but not a huge amount. And if you use caching properly, then, oh my God, the speed ups are ridiculous. At time of recording, I haven't decided whether to state this in the thumbnail or not, but there is the potential to get effectively infinite speed ups in Python using this method. I'm going to be showing you uh, one of those uh, situations where the speed ups are just ridiculous. Um, of course, it's only going to speed up a small amount of your program, but especially if you're calling a function with a certain series of parameters a lot, or if you're calling a certain property a lot, and you know that function is particularly expensive, then caching like this can really help speed your program up enormously. Of course, if you find this video helpful at any point, then consider leaving a like to let me know, and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you want to support this channel monetarily, you can do so by becoming a patron or a member. All the information you need is in the description below. So to start, I'm going to be importing uh, funk tools. Uh, I'm going to be importing cache and LRU cache from funk tools. So these are the two types of cache that you can get funk tools. These work on both methods and functions. I'm only going to be showing on functions today, uh, but they do work on methods just fine. And I'm going to be starting by showing you the normal cache because it's the simpler of the two to use. So you just want to use a decorator like that. And say we have def add x and y, we then, you know, print uh, adding, and that needs to be a format string, x and y uh, together. Oh, I can't spell either, my god, uh, like that. And then we do return just x plus y. If we have if name equals main down here, it's always something you should do. And then we say we print add one and two, and then we say we do that again we'll see that we only see uh, this logging message once. And that's because it's um, it runs the function once to calculate the result and then stores the result in a cache. And then once you call it again, it does a cache lookup and sees, oh, this is in the cache already. And it just returns the result straight out. Uh, the cache is uh, bound to the function parameters. So if we were to do say in the middle here, if we were to do uh, add two and three together, you'll see we have one for adding one and two together, adding two and three together, but then it doesn't add one and two together. And of course it's because if you add one and two together, you haven't cached the result of adding two and three together, so that needs to be cached. So that's a particular advantage of caching a function like this over storing the result of a function in a variable name, for example. One other thing to keep in mind is that the order of arguments do matter, even if you are used keyword arguments. So if we did add two and one like this, uh, we will see that it has to compute adding two and one together, even though we've already done that because adding one and two together and adding two and one together are the same thing, the cache doesn't know it because all it registers is the argument order. If you do something in keyword arguments as well, which actually allows you to kind of have exactly the same function call, just with different argument ordering, it will actually need to recalculate in that instance as well. So do be careful of that. Now we've talked about caching. I want to talk about its slightly more verbose brother or sister, LRU cache. Um, and this can be used just like this, or like this. And we're going to say, uh, we're going to have a square function here just to make things different. And we're going to say squaring x, and then we're going to return x to the power of 2. And then we can get rid of all this. And then we can print square uh, 1, and say we square 2, and then square 3 as well and then chose to square one after all of that. Um, you'll find that it does pretty much exactly the same thing. So or at least it looks like it's doing exactly the same thing. There are small differences under the hood. I'll talk about those in a second, but we have squaring one, squaring two, squaring three, and then we have the result of one already stored. Uh, the main difference between cache and LRU cache is that you can supply a maximum size for the cache. So uh, by default, that's 128. If you provide max size equals none, 
then it essentially becomes this. It becomes exactly the same as this. So LRU cache is just a cache with a maximum size and the LRU um, relates to least recently used. So once the cache is completely filled up, the least recently accessed or least recently used um, cache will be thrown out. So it's not the oldest, it's the least recently used, which means that if you um, are calling something from the cache a lot, even if it happened like half an hour before the other thing, that will stay and the other one will go, which is really nice. So if I were to set this as a max size of three, and actually set it as a max size of three, and then say, oh bloody hell, say we did this and we set this to four and two, what we'd have is it would square one, it would square two, it would square three, and now the cache is full. So we're grabbing um, one again, and it's all good. And then we're squaring four. And then the cache needs, uh, so this needs to go into the cache and then something needs to be thrown out. Uh, but because we've squared one already, squaring two was technically the least recently used from there. So then when we go to square two, we actually need to square two again from scratch because it's not in the cache because it was evicted. So now that we've covered the basics of caching and LRU caching, I wanna show you just how powerful caching can be. And there's no better example of that than the Fibonacci sequence. So for those of you that don't know what the Fibonacci sequence is, you start with zero and then you go to one, and then each element beyond that is the previous two um, items added together. Um, and there's a little bit of a shortcut here if the number is less than two. But other than that, you can use recursion to simply just add the previous two elements together. And for those of you that know what recursion is, you can probably see where this is going. But I'm gonna run this on here, so pyfibonacci.py. It should take about 10 or 11 seconds to run. We're just running it through once, uh, and we're running it to 40. So we're getting um, the Fibonacci sequence 40 elements in. And you can see it takes 11 seconds to do that without caching. If we then did it with caching, it takes nine millionths of a second. Now that is about 1.2 million times faster, just with a single line of code. Now, I'll, I'm not gonna lie, that is absolute clickbait fodder, but I've chosen not to do that because it's, it's a little bit disingenuous to say that caching will make your code millions upon millions of times faster. Sure, it does have the potential to if the entire program is the Fibonacci sequence, but if you're caching, you know, something in the, in the much wider scale, then it's not gonna speed anything else up. It's just gonna speed up the things you've cached. Obviously, caching does have its limitations, so anything that is like, well, if you have like a random number, for example, you don't wanna generate that. But it is particularly useful if you want to uh, if you have an expensive function that you're calling with the same parameters over and over again, especially if that function is particularly expensive because it can save you. I mean, this is just the speed of a dictionary lookup, this nine millionths of a second, as opposed to the 11 seconds uh, of the computation from before. Um, but again, yeah, this is using recursion. So, you know, make it that what you will. But you can see how, you know, it can be infinitely faster <laughs> using caching as opposed to not in certain situations. On top of using it in functions and methods, you can also use it in properties. So I've just put together, you know, a really weird example here. I couldn't really think of a better one, but it has this cached property here. So func uh, from func tools import cached property. Um, and this is both cached and a property. So it's both at once. So if we had a number of a very nice 69, then we can print whether n is prime, and then we can print again whether n is prime. So if you wanted to use it multiple times, obviously. So if we did pi property.py, we can see that it only has to calculate it once, and it calculates that it's false both times, and then it can access it later. Uh, so this is particularly useful if you have an expensive thing and you don't really want to like have multiple uh, variables or multiple attributes, I should really say, and then you have a, like a, a method to uh, that you then assign to the attribute. It's, it all gets a bit messy. This helps clean things up uh, just that little bit nicer. So that's everything that I wanted to talk about caching. 
If you have any questions or any ideas of videos you want me to do in the future, make sure to leave a comment down below. I read every single one, so your feedback is greatly appreciated. I want to say a special thanks to my patrons and members on screen now. One pound a month and you can be on that screen too. A special thanks to Mazard Roshaman III. Sorry if I butchered that again. This is the same recording session. Um, so if you have corrected me, I'll get it right next time. Uh, but I'll see you in the next video. I haven't 100% decided what I want to do yet, but it's probably going to be function overloading in Python because yes, you can do that. And I'll be showing you how to do that next time.